And the elders have a saying. An elder cannot be in the market and the neck of the baby at the back of the mother will be twisted. Among the men of God in Nigeria today, I'm one of the oldest. I'm not saying I'm the greatest, so please don't misquote me. I didn't say I'm the greatest. All I said is, I am one of the oldest. There are very few men of God in Nigeria today who are older than 82. So I, it just occurred to me, I must do something so that all these arguments and etc. Et 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 will come to an end so that we Christians, particularly we Pentecostals, can be united. And then our prayer will be heard by God. And I found that one of the most, uh, how will you call it, contentious issue that have been causing a lot of arguments here and there in the past is the issue of tight. So I made up my mind that I'm going to publicly ask for forgiveness for anything I in particular might have said wrong about Titan. So I told my children on Thursday night, I said, I said something. I said that if you don't pay your tithes, you won't go to heaven. I said, ah, that's not in the Bible. I said, I apologize. I said, what is in the Bible is that you are to follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see God. Huh. Within an hour, it was already in the uh, internet that Pastor Adibri says, don't pay tight. I didn't say that. Fortunately, everything I said is on record. I went to offer what to tell my people. I said it is wrong to tie you down to 10% at a time when, by the grace of God, you should be far, far, far above 10%. I told them a story, not a new story, a story they have had several times, that several years ago, I went to Tulsa to attend Kenneth Higgins camp meeting. And uh, they wanted to take an offering for their Bible college. And one man came to the altar together with his wife and asked for permission to speak. And they gave him the microphone. And he said, I beg all of you who are here today, give very well. Because whatever all of you give, that's what my wife and I alone we give. And we were about 17,000 people. Huh? What, what is this man saying? He said, anything all of you put together can give. That's what my wife and I alone we give. Ha. So some people say, this man is in trouble. Those who didn't want to give before now began to give. At the end, he said they should count everything. They counted, and it was $3.5 million that was contributed. They announced it. And we thought, hey, you are the one who got yourself into trouble. He took the microphone and said, brethren, is this all you can do? Ah. So I said, this man knows something I don't know. Uh, as soon as the service ended, I cornered him. Sir, please, I, I'm from Africa. I came all the way from Africa. Tell me your secret. 
Because you must know something that I don't know. For you to do this kind of thing. He said, you want to know? I said, yes, sir. He said, five years ago, I started a business with $500. And I told God, this is your business. Sir. You are my senior partner. I will not insult you by giving you 10%. I will give you 90%. And I will make do with the remaining 10%. So it's up to you to bless the business. He said that was five years ago. He said this year, the turnover of that little company is $50 million. Hey? I said, thank you very much. And I came back home. And from that day onward, I began to increase the percentage I give to God. I told those of my friends who were around, this is what I learned over there. Today, I am not close to 90%, but I'm far from 10%. I'm telling you the story I told my children on Thursday. So I said it is wrong to tie you down to 10% when God would have taken you to a higher percentage. I said at the beginning, when you were just born again, 10% is okay. It's the minimum God expects from you. But since then, you should have grown. That as you grow in the Lord, you should grow in praising Him, grow in winning souls, grow in praying and grow in giving. In other words, I said the minimum for beginners is what God calls 10%. So I told my young, young ones, I said, so from now on, begin to increase what you give to God. You know, the only thing they, they put on, on the internet, of all that thing that I said, is that Pastor Adibu apologized. And therefore, people should no longer pay their tithes. I said tithes should be minimum. It should be for beginners. What I didn't tell them then was, <laughs> there was a woman Mrs. Graham Douglas of Port Harcourt. If you know those who are close to her, she's, she's gone to be with the Lord now. You can check my story. She got born again and came to me. I said, Daddy, I know how much I have wasted on parties before I got born again. I am not going to be giving 10%. I will be giving God at least 20% from now till I die. She was in a very poor situation at that time. She took that decision. God looked down on her and began to bless her. Before she died, she had become a board member of a very big bank. Because when you trade with God, you will not suffer a loss. It, what the word of God says is, when you sow generously, you will reap bountifully. That's the that's the Bible. So I just want to make it clear. I didn't say don't pay your title. What I said is that that should be your minimum. That's what I said. Now, to add to that, one of my pastors went on the internet and he said he wanted to preach a sermon on why people should not pay tithes. And I watched the sermon. In fact, when he was talking about preaching the sermon, I saw the way he was adjusting his uh, jacket. So I thought, ah, this man is ready for something serious. So I I was ready, quickly got my pen and paper. I wanted to learn 
some heavy stuff. I was disappointed. Because the sermon he preached was just a repetition of what other people have been saying. Forgive me for saying so. Very, very shallow sermon. He said, we shouldn't pay tight because Jesus didn't collect tithes. I said, ha. Jesus was not a parish pastor. He was a world evangelist. Is that correct? And the Bible says there were certain women. You can read it in Luke chapter 8 from verse 1 to 3. Who just gathered themselves together and they said, we will be the treasurers for Jesus Christ. We will maintain his uh, ministry. Now, I know of a bishop. It is of blessed memory now. Who said, he too will gather some women together to be supporting his ministry. So wherever he went, he would take these five women along. I didn't ask whether they were married or not. But one day I cornered him. I said, brother, who are these women following you everywhere? Your wife will be at home. And these women will be following you everywhere. Oh, he said, they are angels of mercy. I said, sir, I hope they are not angels of sin. No. <laughs> Imagine somebody telling you that wherever Daddy Gio goes, he will ask Mommy Gio to stay at home and he will collect some five beautiful women and take them everywhere he goes and call them angels of mercy. Will I be able to stand before you and preach holiness again? And then the, the thing this pastor went on to say, the apostles never collected tithes. I said, that is true. The apostles were not parish pastors. The Bible says, the people, all the Christians of the first time, sold everything they had and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, there's a very big problem. If somebody says that's the way we should be doing it now. Number one, if they say that's the way we should be doing it, then <laughs> I should tell all of you to go and sell everything you have <laughs> and bring the money to Daddy Gio. Number two, it will mean we will say that anybody who wants to become a Christian must be ready to sell everything he has and bring the money to the church. You know the, the kind of problem that we create. But not only that, it was when the disciples, when the apostles were doing that, that politics, first of all, entered into the church. When certain people of a particular tribe began to feed their members better than people who are not of their tribe. If we are to follow the examples of the apostles, eh? <laughs> then if the general overseer is Yoruba, the Igbos will suffer some hunger. If the general overseer is Igbo, oh, God have mercy on the Hausa members. It can't work. It didn't work then. The first time Apostle Peter had to use his power to kill was when a husband and wife sold their land and didn't bring out the money. I'm sure you know the story. What's the name of the couple? Ananias and Sapphira. It's, if this thing didn't work then, how can it work now? So I didn't say don't pay your title, I did not say so. What I said is that should even be your minimum. That you should ask God for grace. That as you are growing in the Lord, 
your percentage that you are giving into the work of his kingdom should be more than 10. That's what I said. That it is wrong for somebody to say, you must not go beyond 10%. That will be wrong. I'll be slowing you down. And so, I want to make that one abundantly clear. But I know this again, of course, <laughs> before the sun rises. This will be on the internet all over the world again. Let me add this one. I am begging all Christians all over the world, let this argument about tight come to an end. Let, 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 please, I, I know you, some of you know much more than I do. I know that a uh, pastor of mine knows much more than I do. But let's do it this way. Particularly you members. If your pastor says he doesn't want tight, don't leave his church. Home. If he says all he wants is offering, give him offering. But if your heart tells you that you should give God at least 10%, Find a church nearby where the pastor says, ah, we can collect tithe, we will use it for the glory of God, and then give that pastor your tithe. <laughs> so you don't quarrel with your pastor, and you don't quarrel with God. Your conscience will be clear. So I'm making that appeal. I'm making an appeal to all my brothers all over the world who believe that they know much more than I do. I agree. I've always told you I don't know much. I don't, I never went to Bible school. The little I know, most of it the Holy Spirit taught me. If you know the truth, much more than I do. The Bible says you are to speak the truth in love. You don't have to quarrel to tell the truth. Tell the world that the boy is wrong. No problem. I've told you I'm probably the most stupid of all people. That's why, <laughs> that's why God chose me to be a pastor anyway. The Bible says it. He chooses the foolish ones. So I admit that. And then there are people who, will, I know there are some of my children who will say, Daddy, if you talk like this, people will be insulting you. Years ago, when God took me to the school of humility, one of the things of humility, one of the things he revealed, and I shared it with those who were around then, is that the word humility and the word humus, you know, humus soil, black soil, they have the same root. That for you to say you are to want to really be humble, you must be ready to be like the soil. People walk on the soil. They smack his head with diggers. At times they defecate on the ground. Does he talk? Does he fight back? That's humility now. Lay on the floor. Let people tramp over you. But the Bible says when you lay yourself on the floor like that, the God will lift you up. You want dominion? You <laughs> we didn't talk about that during the lecture. You must be humble. So let them call me names. That's no problem. But just help me to pray that they will forgive me for everything I've said that is wrong. And let there be peace. Let all of us become united so that God can heal our land when we pray. Before I close, thank you for your attention. 
there's something, one, one more thing that I need to apologize about. This one doesn't concern many of those people outside. It concerns you. You know, I've always said, when I want to let you know how much I love my wife, I've always said that you can do whatever you like to me, but if you dare touch my wife, I will kill you. How many of you have heard that one before? Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry I said that. Because the Bible says, thou shalt not kill. <laughs> so um, I apologize. And so in that case, what, what are you going to do? You are now opening the door for us to attack your wife. No, I've discovered a better prayer. <laughs> what is the better prayer? You want me to tell you? Uh, <laughs> I will only tell you in proverb. You know in Acts of the Apostles chapter 9, when Paul was on the way to Damascus, the Christians in Damascus, they didn't know it was coming. They didn't know trouble was coming. But God stopped them on the way. By the time he arrived with the, among the people that he was going to kill and take to prison, he has already become a brother. Uh, uh, so, so you get the story. <laughs> Let somebody shout hallelujah. So it is time to pray. Uh, just one more thing uh, before, <laughs> before I forget. If you are my son, whether a pastor or not a pastor, and you discover that I am wrong, because I have said it before, the first thing you learn in advanced mathematics is that anybody can be wrong. I'm sure I've told you that one before. And I told my children on Thursday, it is possible to be right and wrong at the same time. And I gave them an illustration. I said, I said as a scientist, I know. For years, we taught that light travels in straight lines, which is correct. Light never bend to take corners. No, it goes straight. But later on, we discover that light does not travel as a rod. It travels straight, but not as a rod, but in waves. It goes galloping like the waves of the sea. That's how light travels. So initially, we were right. It travels in straight lines. But we didn't know that it traveled in waves. So it is possible to be right and wrong at the same time. And I'm always ready to learn. So if you, as my child, discovered something that I'm doing wrong or I'm saying wrong, please come and tell me. I won't chase you away. I won't say, who are you? Uh, don't you know I'm the general overseer? You little boy. <laughs> and by now, you should know that if I have any weakness, by the grace of God, pride is not one of them. No, not at all. If you discover that I've, I'm doing something wrong or I've said something wrong, come to me and explain to me quietly. Don't put it on the internet. You know why? A child that exposes the nakedness of his father is in serious trouble. You know the story of Noah now. Noah got drunk. Hmm? Great man of God. He got drunk. Inside his tent, too. He didn't go to the bar. He was in his house, and he got drunk. And he was on the floor, naked. And the youngest son came in and saw Papa naked. 
<laughs> and he, he ran out to go and tell the other two brothers, hey, come and look, oh, Papa is drunk. He's lying on the floor naked. The elder brothers, they said, ah, we will not even see the nakedness of our father. So they took a piece of cloth and they walked in backwards so that they won't see the nakedness of their father and covered papa with cloth. You know what followed when papa woke up? Don't expose the nakedness of your father. It is dangerous, so God will bless you. All right. Uh, have you forgiven me for anything I've said wrong? Uh, if, if, if at least you have forgiven me, let me hear you shout hallelujah. <laughs> All right, now you stand on your feet. We're going to pray one more prayer before you go home. You're going to cry to the Almighty God and say, Father, the grace to serve you more than ever before. Give it to me. Let me praise you more. Let me serve you more. Let me witness more. And let me give more. Give me the grace to serve you more than ever before. Pray that prayer. And let there be unity among the children of God in the body of Christ. Let there be unity so that our prayers will not be hindered. So that our land will be healed. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. The God I serve, the one who has made me your father, we establish it when I say, you will be forever blessed. Every day of your life, you will get richer and richer. Your pocket will never be dry. You will never beg for food. Your glory will shine brighter and brighter. And you will never know shame. God will go with you as you go. This month will be full of miracles for you. But the next time I see you, you'll be shouting louder, hallelujah. In Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. God bless you. You can go in peace. And the pastors, God bless you. You can go from here. What's the one thing holding you back from living the life God has called you to? I bet it's fear. Fear that whispers, you're not enough, you can't do it, you'll fail. But what if I told you, God never intended for you to live in fear? In fact, he has given you everything you need to overcome it. Today, we're going to talk about how to break free from the chains of fear and walk in the boldness that God has already placed inside of you and it all starts with one thing, faith. Let's dive in. Fear is something we all face. It can be paralyzing, overwhelming, and even make us doubt God's promises. But here's what we need to understand. Fear is not from God. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Let that sink in for a moment. Fear is not your identity. Power, love, and a sound mind are. Fear doesn't get the final say in your life. God's power does. I know some of you are watching this right now feeling like fear has gripped every area of your life. Fear of failure, fear of rejection, fear of the unknown. But here's the good news. Jesus is greater than your fear. When you feel anxious or afraid, you're not meant to carry that weight alone. In fact, Jesus invites us in. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. 
Fear can weigh you down. It can make you feel like you're carrying a burden too heavy to bear. But God is saying, come to me, give that fear to me and I'll give you peace. When you put your trust in God, you start to realize that he's bigger than your fears. Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10 reminds us, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God is literally promising that you don't have to do it alone. He's holding you up, even when the fear feels overwhelming. What if, instead of focusing on your fears, you started focusing on God's promises? Practical Steps to Overcome Fear So, how do we practically overcome fear in our daily lives? Here are three key steps. Number one, meditate on God's Word. The Bible is full of promises that combat fear. One of my favorites is Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Read scriptures like this daily, remind yourself of God's truth, and fear will lose its grip on your heart. Number two, pray boldly. Prayer is not just asking God for things, it's an exchange. When you come to God in prayer, give him your fear and receive his peace. Philippians chapter four, verses six to seven tells us, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Number three, take action in faith. Fear tries to freeze you in place, but faith moves you forward. Whatever God is calling you to do, do it despite the fear. That's where real courage comes from. Not the absence of fear, but moving forward, through it with the strength of God by your side. In conclusion, listen, I don't know what fears you're facing right now, but I do know this. God has already given you the power to overcome them. You don't have to live in fear anymore. You can live boldly, confidently, and courageously because God is with you. Remember Romans chapter 8, verse 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? So, don't let fear have the final word in your life. Instead, let faith rise up. Let God's promises lead the way. If this message has touched you, don't keep it to yourself. Share it with someone who needs to hear it. And don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell for more content that will strengthen your walk with Christ. Let's break free from fear together.